So I'm excited to uh, do something a little bit different this, this morning. So uh, I was anticipating that not too many up in the balcony, so those in the balcony, you know, I'm going to write as big as I can. I sat all around the sanctuary to see if I write big enough. You should be able to see it, but then, of course, I'm assuming your eyesight is, is good or bad as mine, and so um, you just kind of holler, or feel free, there's four front rows right here, uh, feel free to draw near and draw close if you'd like to be able to see, see a little bit better on the, on the dry erase board, but um, we're continuing the series, we're, we're in Ephesians this summer, and so I've heard several of you too, you're, you've been already reading Ephesians, um, I mentioned to you it takes about 25 minutes to read Ephesians, the whole, the whole letter, and uh, I encourage you. Keep marinating on this. Meditate on it. Um, this, this, this book, this letter, I said it could just as easily be called Old Hickorians or Nashvillians or Americans or anyone who lives. Um, that God's word, especially in, in Ephesians, is it's so applicable to everybody in every situation. Um, it tells our story. It tells God's story. It tells where our two stories kind of collide together, too, of what God is wanting to do in us and in the world. And so... We're in Ephesians chapter 2, and what I wanted to do is, I'm going to come back to the NIV, and the NIV is what you have in the Pew Bibles too, so you can follow along with me, because the first part, especially the sermon, it'll be a little interactive, so I'm going to have you help me um, kind of fill out some, some statements on here on the, on the dry erase board, and so I, follow, I encourage you to have your Bibles open, follow along with me, but I, I love the way the message, Eugene Peterson, uh, in the message, he gives a great paraphrase, it just has new and fresh language, and so... When I have this up on the screen, I want you to go ahead and just read, read along with me on the message. And then we're going to come back to the NIV as we kind of transition over here. Read this with me. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all of this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next, to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we've done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both making and saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, God. So, I love this, because what, what Paul's doing here is this. He's, he's given us a before and after picture. And if you're like me, you know, there's so many TV shows that have the whole before and after. You know, how many of you watch Biggest Loser? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, three of you. Yeah. The rest of you have, you're just not admitting it right now. Um, but, but we all see, we love the before and after, after, because we see the transformation before and after. Before someone lost 150 or 200 pounds, you're like... Whoa, that's an incredible transformation that we saw. We, we, we love before and after pictures. Facebook is filled with them almost every day. If you get on Facebook, you see someone before the haircut and after the haircut. You see someone before the tattoo and after the tattoo. Um, you see before and after. You, you see everything. You see all these before and afters. And if you're probably like my wife, and I'm, it's growing on me, um, I'm not really quite there with the Food Network, but HGTV, I'm starting to enjoy that a little bit more. Um, but if you've seen Fixer Upper, you, you gotta love these before and after. I mean, it's extreme home makeover, you've got all these shows. But Fixer Upper is, is great. And Chip and Joanna, right? Did I get it right? Yeah, there we go. See Chip and Joanna? I am not Chip by any means. My wife is, 
is a Joanna S for sure. You know, she's got an eye for some of those things, but for me, I default to my father-in-law um, because we we, per we purchased the picture of her. Um, and yes, amen. And my father-in-law can testify to this um, on a regular basis. So you know, people have asked, "When are you going to move in?" I've stopped deciding when that's going to happen. Um, we we've talked about it before. We thought, I you know maybe sometime in April, maybe by the end of May, maybe by. I'm not even done. I'm done. But it is getting closer. And my father-in-law, bless his heart, he's like a one-man show because I'm completely inept when it comes to fixing things up. All right? So he has been doing this. But, but let me tell you, I, I love this because we're getting there. We're kind of like in the home stretch where you should have seen what it looked like in December when we purchased this home. And you should look at it now. And, it, and we still got ways to go. But what's happening is this thing is being fixed up. And if there's anything I can tell you, what I love in this passage of Scripture you and I are fixer-uppers. You and I are all fixer-uppers. There is a before and there is an after picture that God already has in mind for you and for me. And all of us are here and we know what the before is. You've got to get to the before first. And so I want you to open your Bible and, and I want you to help me here with this, all right? So when we talk about the before and after, Paul is fully aware of this. If there's anybody who knows what a before and after picture looks like, the Apostle Paul is a good example. And I can just tell you one before and after picture. Before, Paul was killing Christians. After, this man is laying his life down for the sake of Christ every day. Experiencing the full range of suffering for the sake of Christ. Talk about an extreme before and after. Someone who's standing at the foot of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, as Stephen is being stoned to death. An apostle, Paul, not at the time an apostle, but he's looking and saying, yep, take him out. I mean, Paul was, he was a zealot, which means this, he, he took up a sword. He was so zealous for God, he's like, I would kill other people for, for my love for God. So if anybody is blasphemous, if anybody is kind of derailing this whole Jewish belief of one God, was well, Jesus and all those followers of Jesus. And Paul, he loved God so much, he's like, I would kill Christians because I love God so much. And then you have the after picture. Paul, who is professing Christ all to the very ends of the earth, and he's laying his life down and suffering for the sake of Christ. I love it. I love it before and after. So he's talking to a church now, Ephesus, church, church in Ephesus, the church at Old Hickory, and says, let me remind you what you were before. You need to remember what you were before, and don't ever forget this. There's an after picture that Christ is doing in you and in me and in the whole church. All right? But we've got to start with the before. So if you look at the first three verses, if you got everybody got their Bibles open up to, to Ephesians chapter 2, all right, I don't know if you can see this in the back. Can everybody back there? You got it? All right, Blake, you, okay, even the balcony. So if you can't read it, go to the balcony, and you'll be able to read it there, right? Okay, here's before, and here's after. And so first verse, what, what, what were we before? What, how does it start? How does Paul start? Ephesians 1. I mean, 2, verse 1. We were dead. We were dead. Yes, I love it. So here's the picture. We were dead. We were dead. We were dead in our sin. We were dead in our transgressions. And, and let me just say this too. When you are spiritually dead, you typically don't know it. Dead people don't know they're dead. They only know they were dead when they were raised up. When they were made alive. So this, this before picture, this is for the church. Those who know, I know what I was before. I was dead. I was dead dead. I was spiritually dead. I was dead in my sin. Keep going. What, what else does it say? End of verse 2. Okay, many sins, all right. What else? Disobedient. Disobedient, yes. Disobedient. Okay, yeah, all right. And we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, too. What is the exact language there? We follow the what? We follow what? Okay, yeah, we follow the, the prince. Yes. And some will say this, the prince of the heir. We're the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Some of your translations will have some different things here. And let me just say this before. So, yes, we're dead in our sins. We've got this spirit of disobedience. It says in the NIV, we follow the ways of the world, and we follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is a nice fancy way and a fancy title for the devil or Satan. And here's the idea. The worldview in the first century was this. What is this whole idea? Follow the prince of the air or the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The idea was this. Between Earth and between the Moon, the understanding in first century worldview for the Romans, for Greeks, 
For the Jewish, they would understand this language too. But Paul's talking to a church full of Gentiles. So their whole worldview is this. Their understanding is between earth and between the moon, this air, this stratosphere, this is where demonic forces were at work. And so these powers that were at work in the air would influence what's happening on the earth. So the powers that are in the air actually have power and force over even human beings. They control and manipulate even human beings. So the idea is this. Paul is saying this. Here's the first century. We are dead in our sins. We, are, we have a spirit of disobedience. The spirit of rebellion is the same spirit that is at work in Satan. It's that same spirit that actually influences us. Now, this is interesting. So our worldview is a little bit different today. We're not living in the first century. But what we understand is this. You and I know that there are powers that influence us, and sometimes we don't even know it. Right? Let me give you an example. You and I as Americans are influenced and manipulated by the power of consumerism on a regular basis. And sometimes we don't even do it. We follow it just like a little sheep to the slaughter. Oh yeah, you tell me I need that, I'll spend money on it. And we do it because consumerism tells me I ought to do that. I ought to accumulate, I ought to get. I need more, I want to get more. You and I, we are manipulated all the time. And we just, every time we go to the TV and turn on the commercials. And every time I see a commercial for Alexis, I, man, the desire in me, I'm like, oh, it'd be so nice, but a Camry will have to do, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, Camry's a nice car. I love my Camry, too. Um, but we, we, are, we, are, we are influenced by powers. And consumerism is not the only power that it was at, is at work even in our own lives. But you and I know, if we admit it, there are powers that influence us. Sometimes we don't even realize it. We find ourselves in places and situations because there was a power that was at work that kind of led us into a situation like, how in the world did I ever get here? What, what led me here? Well, it's my free will. Yes, it is. But let me tell you, Paul's understanding, when you read all of Paul's letters in the New Testament, he writes to the church in Rome and the church of Corinth and the church in Ephesus, Paul understands this. We as sinners, we are first of all victims, and second, secondarily, we're rebels. Paul's whole worldview is this. There are forces at work against us. Now, you and I, we don't get off the hook by saying, well, the devil made me do it. That's an excuse. No, you need to take full responsibility for your actions. But yes, Paul understood there are powers that are at work that we cannot see, and sometimes we can see, that are manipulating us. And this is the idea. So what we were before was this. We were dead in our sins. We, were, we had a spirit of disobedience. The same spirit that was at work with the prince of the air. And we are people who are now, we are dead in our sins. Anything else? Anything else you see in verses 1 through 3? What else? Okay, our passionate desires, yes. All right, so we follow. Yeah, what, what other word? Passionate desires, what else? Okay, some will say sinful nature, good. Anything else? Gratifying the uh, cravings of our flesh. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love it. Okay, yes. Cravings. Cravings of sinful flesh. All right, how are we doing? I know it's a little messy up here, but you guys are at least getting the point here. What, what I love about this language is this. In the NIV, it will talk about craving. The cravings and the desires. Here's what happens. Before, this is what I love, this is what I love about Eugene Peterson. Before, we would just do whatever we wanted to do whenever we wanted to do it. Whatever is in me and in my desire, if my body tells me to do something, I do it. Now, you all know this, too, because that's what I was confessing in the Sunday school class. You know, when I was a, a summer before my freshman year in high school, you know, I thought the Lord, he had helped me when I went to that altar that, that summer at summer camp, and I gave my all to Christ. And I said, God, I'm fully surrendered to you. You have all of me. You have all of me. And I want all of you. And I was on fire for Jesus. And then I started dating a girl. Yes. And then I started out, and now listen, it wasn't the girl's fault. It was because there was something, something in me, something in me that said, I want something that I know is not quite appropriate yet, but my body still wants it. But I know that my commitment to Christ tells me, hold on, Tony. There's an appropriate context for the desire that you have in your heart, and it's not right now. Well, Lord, 
Don't torment me, please, right? Yeah, that's it. But the idea was this. You all know this. Any kind of craving within us, too. We have desires within us. We have desires that are part of our sinful flesh. Now, here's the thing. Some translations will say sinful nature. It's probably more accurate to say flesh because that's the actual word there. The idea is this. It's not that our flesh is sinful in and of itself. I'm not, you're not sinful, I'm not sinful just because we have desire for sex. We're not sinful just because we're in flesh. The idea is this. Because of the brokenness of our world, we have been influenced in such a way, this spirit of disobedience that is at work within us, that what, what Paul will say too is, yes, we allow our flesh to just have whatever our flesh wants. And we'll operate this way. And what we were before, we were, we were just like dumb sheep who just did whatever our bodies told us to do. Whatever the powers that were at work in us or powers that are at work outside of us, we did what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. And that's, that's what we were before. And what that leads to is this. It leads to death. You do whatever you want to do. You follow the ways of the world. You follow the ways of your heart. What happens when your heart is evil and wicked? That's the worst advice you can give to anybody. Just follow your heart. That is terrible advice. That's terrible. It will lead you ultimately to death until God changes your heart. And so what we were before, we were dead. We were disobedient. We follow the prince of the air. We follow the cravings of our sinful flesh. We follow the passionate desires of that, that sinful nature, the, the sinful flesh that is at work within us. But here's the picture of before. You and I are all fixture uppers. Because what God saw in you and what God saw in me was, I already had the after picture in mind. I already got it in mind. From the foundation of the world, I already know what I want you to be. And I already know what I've created you to be. And sin has wreaked a whole lot of havoc. But I love this. This is great. The fixture upper. We don't watch that show, and I, I don't watch that show, and we didn't buy our house to say, wow, look at our fixture upper. Isn't it awesome? No, we bought a fixture upper because we knew it needed to be worked on. And we knew we're already envisioning what the after picture looks like. And my father in law has done an outstanding job. And my wife has been in, she's given the, the picture of like, what is this thing going to look like? And I'm just like, Awesome. It looks great. Yes, let's just move, let's move in. Yep. Let's hire Chip and Joanna right now, and they can come help Rob to, to get this thing, get this thing done. What we were before, this is what we were before. And in verse 4, this is the good news. He doesn't leave us like this. He doesn't leave you to just follow the desires of your wicked heart. He doesn't leave you dead. Verse 4 says what? He do what? He, yes. God. Who is rich in mercy? If you take anything today with you, this visual right here, take that with you. Our God is a God who is rich in mercy. He is not rich in condemnation. He is not rich in revenge. He is not rich in anger. Our God comes to us and he looks at us and his heart is full of mercy and he says, I have something better for you. And I don't want to leave you where you were. Because I already have the after picture in mind. I know what you are before. And some of you, just like me, some of us need more work than others. <laughs> some of us need a whole lot more remodeling and renovating than others of us. But thanks be to God who is rich in mercy. Who makes us after. He does what? Makes us we were dead. Yeah. Makes us alive. And this key phrase here, you'll see it three times. With Christ. So when he makes us alive with Christ, what else does he do? After he makes us alive, what does he do? Okay, see, before he seats us, what does he do? Yeah, you see, what's the, what's the next line? He raises us. So he makes us alive. He raises us. Raises us with Christ, and then he exalts us. And I love the way that Eugene Peterson says, here's what Jesus does. Not only does he wake us up from the dead and says, hey, look, I have the after picture in mind. He raises us, he wakes us up, he raises us with Christ, and then what does he do? He exalts us all the way to the highest heavens to sit right down at the right hand of God the Father, right with Jesus. And Paul talks about this to past tense. 
which means you and me, if you are a follower of Christ, you already are positioned at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, right there with Jesus. That's powerful imagery. And what that means for you and me, you all know, I, well, I'm in church right now on a Sunday morning at Old Hickory Nazarene. I'm clearly not at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Here's what Paul envisions for you and for me. Live now as if the future has already come. Because that is what Christ has already, already promised to you and to me. He's already promised the after picture. Live now as if the future has already come. That is our promise. That is the work that we are doing as Christians in the world. I've said it before. This is when we pray the Lord's Prayer. That's why we pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the people who bring about the kingdom of God in this world. Jesus is coming back and he is saying to his church, I'm waiting on you, church. And we're like, well, we're waiting on you, Jesus, to come fix this mess. And he's saying, I've called you and invited you to help me fix the mess. So get busy. And I will fill you and empower you to do the work that I've called you to do. And that's where this passage is leading to at the very end of verse 10. Where does, what is verse 10? We're going to jump right to it right now. What's verse 10 say? After we are what? We are his workmanship. After. We are God's. Yes. Workmanship. We are his handiwork. We are his accomplishment. I love it. You and I are his masterpiece. God already has the after picture in mind. And this is the reality of what Christ does when we come to Christ. This is what we were before, and this is what we are after. It is because of the God who is rich in mercy who comes to us and says, I'm not going to leave you here. Because you're destined for that. I'm not going to leave you here because you're destined for that. Okay, so we've been um, remodeling the home. Okay, I use we loosely. Um, yes, I work, yeah, I worked, yeah. I put in a solid eight hours in the last six months. Um, so, I, yeah, I painted. I did a little bit. Yeah, thanks. See, see you much earlier. Um, I'm talking just like Chip Gaines. Yeah, no. So... The, the, the whole idea, though, is this. I, I look at this, and I, and I love the imagery of this, because we don't fix up a house so that we can look at the house and say, wow, that's a beautiful house. We fix up a house to use it. We fix up a house because a house has an intended use and function. And let me tell you, even for you and for me, God fixes us up as his masterpiece, not so everyone can look at us and say, wow, God's got some pretty awesome trophies out there. God's got some pretty amazing masterpieces out there. You and I are a masterpiece and a handiwork and craftsmanship because we have an intended function, and it's to go and do the good works that he has prepared us to do ahead of time. Because a home, when you fix up a home too, my wife and I aren't excited for Rob to help us be done with this home so we can say, wow, what a beautiful home. Because in that home already, we already have an after picture too. Of, we already see what we want to use this house for. Not only is it for our family, not only do we want to have safety and protection and shelter for our family, yes, we want our home to be a home of hospitality. We, are, we want our home to be, and this is why scripture will call us to even entertain strangers. Entertain them. Welcome you to the strangers. Because some people have entertained angels and they didn't even know it. But what God has intended for us as fixer uppers too is to be a people full of compassion, full of mercy. So if you want to use the house analogy, start welcoming people into your home. Start welcoming the least of these into your home. I mean, we have been created and we are craftsmanship and we are workmanship and we are a masterpiece created to do good works. And God prepared for us a long time ago. I love this. You and I are fixer-uppers. If you leave this place to know this. Know that you're a fixer-upper, and if you don't know that yet, I'm going to remind you. You are a fixer-upper. And just like my, my father-in-law said this too, my life feels like this. Sometimes when you feel like God has finally done something in your life, you're like, man, I'm just really making progress in my walk with Christ. And then all of a sudden, he, tell, he, came up, he comes up from the, down the basement. 
Nails just pop through again downstairs. I just painted that thing and nails pop through. I love that analogy because you and my life is like that sometimes. I just fresh coat of paint. And then, and then this, where did that come from? Where did that craving, where did that, it's like that desire snuck up when I least expected it. It was like a nail that just went right through the fresh coat of paint. And you're like, mm. But let me tell you, just because you and I are a fixer-upper does not mean we are not beneficial and useful for the kingdom of God. Just because you and I need more renovating and remodeling done in us does not mean we are not useful for God's kingdom. It does not mean you and I are not beneficial, and it does not mean we cannot do good works for God. It just means that you and I as fixer-uppers are fully aware of this. I always need the God who is rich in mercy. Always. It doesn't matter how sanctified and holy I get. I'm always dependent on the God who's rich in mercy. Because what he is doing in my heart and what he's doing in your heart is this. He's taking a heart that was dead, a heart that was rebellious, a heart that followed the ways of the world, and he's giving us a new heart. And that's why the whole language of the Old Testament says this. God's promise that God who's rich in mercy says, a day is coming in Christ Jesus when I will give you a new heart. It will not be a heart of stone. It's going to be a heart of flesh. I'm going to give a new spirit to you, not a spirit of rebellion. I'm going to give you a spirit of obedience. And that is the work of what we call the Nazarene Church, sanctification. It is the work of heart transformation. It is the work of renovation and remodeling and restoration. Because all of you, you and me, we all need the handyman, and his name is God, to do the work. Because you and I can't do it. And that's why Paul will say over and over, it is by his grace that you have been saved. It is by his grace that you are restored. It is by his grace that you are renovated from the inside out. It is by his grace that you are a masterpiece created to do good works. It's never apart from his grace. Because if I thought it was me, then I might just, as Paul says, I would boast about it and say, man, I am pretty awesome. I can fix myself up. No, I can't. And you can't fix yourself up either. No, no, no. I can, I can do enough obedience for him. You can't. It's by his grace that saves you, and it's by his grace that you are transformed. Your work and my work, this is what Ephesians at least will say. It doesn't mean we don't play any part. Our part is this. Our part is to trust and to have faith and believe that God is doing this in us. And he is cooperating with us, yes. But it's God who does the work. I believe and I trust and I'm learning to keep in step with what the Spirit of God is doing in me. So that what Paul will say later in another book in Galatians, he'll say, we don't, we don't live according to this anymore. We don't live according to the sinful flesh anymore. We live according to the Spirit. Stop gratifying the cravings of your sinful flesh and start doing what God has called you to because you are now born of the Spirit. The whole language of Scripture is beautiful. When we come to Christ, we're like a brand new baby. That's why we use the language of we're born again. We were born of flesh and blood. Yes, that happened when we came out of our mother's womb. But when you come to know Christ, you were born of the Spirit. And where Paul will say, too, your life and my life as God does this work, we will feel the tension still at times of the flesh that as holy as I get, I wish I could say that I'm not tempted anymore. <laughs> You all know this. I've shared this before, too. Yes, I wish I could say that, yeah, temptation just disappears. You and I know that's not true. Jesus was tempted. It's, it's not wrong to be tempted. In fact, the, the more you grow closer to Christ, my guess is this, the temptations probably will start compounding to derail you. Because there are powers that are at work that want to derail you. Not just your own desire within you that wants to derail yourself at times. But God, who's rich in mercy, says, my grace is enough. It's the grace that will forgive when you stumble and trip up. But my grace is enough to actually get you to the after picture. It is the grace that restores you. And so anytime you and I come to a table to receive the grace of God, be reminded of his forgiveness, one, 
Be reminded of, yes, I was dead in my sins. And there are sins that have maybe perhaps crept up in your life this week. I don't know. But when you receive the grace, receive this forgiveness. Because it is the God who is rich in mercy who offers it to us in Christ Jesus. But don't stop there. Because he didn't just create us to forgive us. He created us to restore us to say, you, you are my handiwork. And I've got a purpose for you. And there are good works that I've called you to do. And so the reason that he is restoring us and renewing us is so that we can be who he's called us to be.